We must now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy. Uh, question 5 has been withdrawn. Um, I call Richie McPhillips. Deputy Principal Speaker, can I begin by asking the Minister for the Economy to outline the discussions that his department is having regarding broadband and mobile, the mobile, broadband and mobile phone providers to increase connectivity in Fermanagh South Tyrone? Principal, can, I remind, sorry, can I remind members they need to call the number of their question? I call the Minister. Principal Deputy Speaker, my department has ongoing discussions with the communications industry looking at issues affecting consumers across Northern Ireland, including in Fermanagh and South Tyrone. My officials meet regularly with representatives of the major telecommunications providers who operate within this privatised and independently regulated market. Ongoing investment by mobile network operators has led to increases in mobile coverage across Northern Ireland. However, I recognise that services still need to be improved. In Northern Ireland, 99.3% of premises are in areas where there is outdoor 4G coverage from at least one operator, and 3G coverage is among the best in the UK. There are regular meetings with BT to discuss the rollout of broadband under the contracts managed by my department. In June, BT reported that some 5,607 premises have benefited from the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project in Fermanagh and South Tyrone, and 1,390 have taken up new broadband services. BT also report that the Superfast Rollout Project has improved services to over 500 premises in the Fermanagh and Dungannon areas. The contract with uh, BT has a mechanism where funding can be reinvested when take-up of, of services exceeds a certain threshold or underspends are identified. This is currently around £3 million, and we have begun clarifying where these funds might be used. It is important to recognise that where fixed-line broadband is not viable, there are other technology alternatives available in particular for those premises that continue to have access to services uh, of less than 2 megabytes per second. My department offers assistance with the cost of installing a basic broadband service using satellite or wireless technology. It ensures that no household or business which meets the eligibility criteria need pay more than £400 to access a broadband scheme over a 12-month period. We will continue discussions with the telecoms industry and with other interested parties, especially through this consultation phase of the draft programme for government. Richie McPhillips for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and apologies. Can the Minister, and I thank the Minister for his answer, can the Minister outline what approach his department has taken to recover some of the £258 million clawback owed back to the UK Government by BT on broadband contracts? And can he outline whether he will direct these funds into rural areas? Yeah, the, the, the member, I think, in the figure that he quotes of around £250 million is perhaps, I think, maybe talking about the totality of potential clawback across the, the entirety of, of the United Kingdom and, and where this gain share uh, or clawback, as it's sometimes referred to, comes in, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, or Principal Deputy Speaker, is, is where uh, uptake um, exceeds expectations in terms of the contract that was initially agreed uh, with BT in terms of broadband improvement. Uh, as I mentioned in my, my answer, uh, the estimated uh, figure in respect of that at this minute in time for Northern Ireland would be around about £3 million, uh, and we are currently in a process of identifying uh, where that might be best spent, and obviously that will have to be consistent with uh, value for money principles, um, and also targeted to where there is most need, and I'm sure, um, as we have already invested, as I've outlined uh, to the member in his constituency, which I recognise is an area which has uh, some issues in terms of getting um, acceptable speeds in terms of broadband, uh, I am sure that some of that £3 million will be invested in his constituency at this stage, uh, I'm not able to say how much or where, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that we will be targeting some of that £3 million into Fermanagh and South Tyrone. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Is the Minister aware of the concerns that there has been raised by the Border, border Councils through the Rickban report? In particular, there are many practical solutions in both providing greater connectivity and achieving equability recompense from BT and its failure to adequately support my constituents, as outlined in the ICBAN report, Fibre at the Crossroads. Can I remind members to make sure their questions are short? Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Yeah, I thank the member for her question. I recently met with uh, representatives of ICBAN, a delegation. Uh, led by my party colleague, Councillor Paul Robinson, uh, came to discuss their fibre of the, of the Crossroads report with me a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a useful uh, discussion that we had, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for the points that they were making in terms of ensuring that 
uh, people in, in uh, border counties uh, have, um, particularly in Fermanagh and South Thurrow and other parts of Northern Ireland, ha have acceptable broadband speeds. Um, and that's why uh, I, I don't. I know how much she is critical of BT, and I have been critical of BT sometimes in this House. Um, we have been able to make a substantial amount of investment in our broadband infrastructure across Northern Ireland. Some £60 million has been invested, £64 million has been invested across Northern Ireland since 2008. Uh, and on the broadband improvement project itself, as I pointed out to Mr McPhillips, um, some 5,600 premises have benefited from, in, in the Fermanagh and South Tyrone constituency, have benefited from that. Some 1,390 have taken up new broadband services. Uh, I would also point out to, to the member and indeed to the House, as I have done on, on, on other occasions in the Assembly, that uh, whilst there is a, a focus on, as there is in the ICBAN report, on getting fibre into premises, there are at this moment in time uh, other technologies, alternative technologies available like wireless and like satellite broadband uh, and support is provided through my department uh, to those alternative technologies for those who can't get an acceptable uh, level of uh, speed of broadband through, through fibre or get fibre at all. Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, has the black spots and the gaps in broadband provision in Fermanagh to Tyrone been identified and could he give us reaction to, to the proposed changes by the advertising and standards agency. And the minister can choose which question he answered. Well, Madam uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, yeah, I, I think that I very much welcome the news last week that um, the advertising standards authority have taken a decision that was announced to um, to reform or change the rules in respect of advertising of broadband speeds. Um, and the member in the house might recall that. Uh, some months ago, I wrote to the uh, Advertising Standards Authority, particularly around this issue. It was an issue that was brought to, to my attention by uh, members like Lord Morrow about the, um, the perception that there were in some parts of Northern Ireland, wherever you know, advertisements were appearing on billboards, and newspapers, on television, that you could get speeds of 30 megabytes per second and beyond, and yet that wasn't um, accessible in some parts of, of Northern Ireland. Yet people were uh, buying broadband packages from some providers that were um, paying the same as I was paying, for example, for having those sorts of speeds in, in, in my home, and I don't think that was fair, and that was the basis upon which I, I wrote to the ASA on that. And I'm glad that they have identified the, uh, the problem and they are going to change the rules next year. Um, I think this is part an infrastructure problem, and the member mentions black spots. Um, what we are doing in respect of the three million pounds of gain share that I mentioned in response to Mr. McPhillips is we, we have, are in contact, Principal Deputy Speaker, with local councils to, to get them to do audits of their area to identify um, where there are some of those black spots, uh, where broadband is not at an accessible, uh, acceptable speed. Um, and I think the Fermanagh and OMA Council are, if they haven't started it, they're about to start their audit. And I look forward to getting that information coming back because I do believe that councils will be in a good position to identify where there are weaknesses, where there are, are black spots. That will then help to inform where we spend that three million pounds worth of, of clawback that we will get as a result of the broadband improvement project. Here, sir, Michelle Gildrenew. I call Michelle Gildrenew. Gourmet Mayog of Las Congorla. I would suggest that the Minister would spend some of that three million in BT70 because my children are about to divorce me. Um, we Member have come to our question. <laughs> does, I've, I've listened carefully to the Minister's answer and can I ask him what more he can do to maximise connectivity to those black spots and the, the hard to reach areas? Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I, I, I think there I recognise that. I mean, we have, we have made a lot of investment over the last number of years, uh, some 64 million, as I pointed out before, invested in a range of different broadband projects since 2008. Um, that helped to give Northern Ireland a, a competitive advantage in terms of being the first uh, region with 100% broadband capability in the whole of Europe. Um, we have not maintained that advantage in recent times in spite of the considerable investments that we have made. I want to regain that competitive advantage. Uh, and it's not just about uh, obviously getting uh, households to get a good speed of, of broadband, but it's also to help our economy. And I've, I visited uh, some companies, uh, including some in the members' constituency, who are, are struggling sometimes to get the speed that they require to do business in an ever increasingly closer connected global, uh, global economy. So I want to make sure that those businesses have that competitive edge. And we're looking at a, a range of different options that, that would see uh, some considerable investment required, but it would give Northern Ireland back its competitive advantage in terms of broadband connectivity. I call Naomi Long. Question number two, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The apprenticeship levy will be introduced from April of 2017. The collection of the levy is a reserve matter to the UK Government. It will impact on all employers with an annual pay bill in excess of £3 million. 
Her Majesty's Treasury announced on Monday, the 14th of November, 2016, the appointments, uh, apportionment, sorry, for the devolved administrations. Northern Ireland will be allocated £76 million, £79 million and £82 million over the next three years. However, Her Majesty's Treasury have removed £52 million due to a reduction of funding for existing apprenticeships in England and a further £29 million reduction to the public sector contribution to the levy, which will result in a £5 million pressure on the overall block grant. Importantly, approximately £80 million was spent by the Executive on work-related training for businesses, including apprenticeships in 2015-16. Over the past four years, £86.5 million has been invested in apprenticeship training alone. It is important that employers have access to the appropriate skills training, particularly in the form of apprenticeships. I want to ensure that support for skills is based on a quality offering and value for money. I intend to consult with employers and other interested stakeholders to seek their views on the implications of the introduction of the apprenticeship levy in Northern Ireland. This consultation will be designed to take the temperature of the business community and focus thoughts regarding the needs for businesses in terms of skills and apprenticeships. I call Steve Aiken. My apologies. Such a, such I call the only long. Uh, thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, does the finance, um, the finance Minister um, and the Economy Minister have set out an approach which will effectively mean that businesses will pay the apprenticeship levy, but there will be no additional investment in skills as a result of paying that levy? Is there any scope for the Minister to undertake to ring fence money for additional spending on professional, technical and vocational skills in order that we don't end up with a disgruntled sector who feel they're paying additional money as, as an apprenticeship levy but not getting anything additional in return? Can I remind members just to keep the questions brief? I, 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 thank you, Prime Minister. I thought the first answer was so comprehensive that it answered all the members' questions. Um, the, the important point is, look, I, I, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be completely I'm really frank and honest about this. I, 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 don't, I, I think the apprenticeship levy is a bad thing. I think it is a tax on, I mean, it's called a levy, but it's a pretty brutal, crude tax on, on businesses in Northern Ireland who, as a member has identified, are already paying through their tax, tax, other taxes for skills training that are provided uh, by government and by others. Um, the, the important point, which I, I read out to the member, and the member is right to point out that. Uh, I have been in very, very close contact since taking office with the finance minister in regard to this, because what we, what we receive back from Treasury through this levy um, slash tax is incredibly important about what we do next in terms of the next steps in terms of what we can provide for, for employers. Uh, and the important point is, as I've mentioned in my original answer, which the Treasury, in typical Treasury style, tell us here's £76 million that you're going to get next year. With the other hand, they're taking some £52 million off us. And when you take the public sector contribution itself of £29 million out of that, we're in a net negative position of minus £5 million. So in, in some ways, in one interpretation of that, that's eating into uh, that nearly um, that 80 million odd, 80 odd million pounds that we're paying annually for skills training for businesses. Um, but look, I, I'm completely aware of the concerns that many employers have, I'm very, um, very much in close contact with businesses over having since taking, taking office in this. I want to, to take their temperature, and that's what the, the purpose of a consultation is, uh, to ask uh, employers for, and indeed other stakeholders, what ideas they might have. Um, what they think of this current skills training that we're providing for businesses, and then it will be a matter for myself and the finance minister to discuss, particularly in the context of the, uh, the budget, which will come to the House before the end of the year, as to what we might be able to do to ensure that uh, skills training of the highest quality is still provided for businesses in Northern Ireland. I called Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Minister, for his comments so far. Um, a lot of the questions have already been answered as we've gone through, but I think. One of the things that many of the companies have can been talking to, and you've been to talking question? to as well, I'm getting to the question. Uh, can the member and despite, to the, question? Can, despite the considerable disquiet amongst Northern Ireland businesses about the shortfall in skills training, wait for it. How he can will envisage how our companies, you've got it, how our companies are not going to be penalised. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, the question is, how are we going to ensure that many of the Northern Ireland companies who will be paying this tax, particularly the ones who have the majority of their business in Great Britain, are not going to decide to go there, move their headquarters there and move their training there? Because they see this as very much as a case of double taxation. That's the question, Minister. Yeah, thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I, think, I think my bad influence is rubbing off on, on members uh, during my, my own question time. If they, the lack of brevity that there have been in some of the, uh, the questions, never mind the answers that I provide. Um, but uh, the, um, the, 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 the member, I, that is one of the concerns that I have always had in respect of, of, of this living. I know it was a concern that the, the previous Minister for Employment and Learning had. Look, I, I, I don't think at this stage, I, whilst I have some concerns, and there have been some employers who are in that sort of space that the member is talking about, Principal Deputy Speaker, I haven't yet heard from anybody saying specifically that that would be their intention. And I think it, it, it is, as, as is often the case, much more sophisticated than that. Whilst, yes, they might feel that they're being uh, double taxed, um, there are other, a range of other reasons as to why those employers are based here in Northern Ireland, particularly in, in relevance to the question why they continue to provide training from bases here in, in Northern Ireland. But look, as I've said before, I don't, I don't like this tax, I don't like this levy. Uh, I think it is punitive, um, I think it is harmful, uh, and I think you can very, very clearly see how harmful it is to Northern Ireland's public finances. So I have a challenge on my hands to ensure that we continue, given the reductions that there are, to, to ensure that we continue to maintain the level of spending that we are on apprenticeships and indeed on other skills training for, for businesses, but be assured that given, given the centrality of talent and skilled workforce to Northern Ireland's proposition for inward investment and for the growth of local businesses, uh, I'd be determined to do that in what is going to be a very, very difficult uh, budgetary climate moving forward. Colin Mervyn story. Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for uh, the comments that he's made, particularly in placing on record in relation to the, the concerns that we would have uh, with regards to the apprenticeship levy. Could the Minister outline to the House uh, what annually his department annually invests in apprenticeships, given the important place that they, pl they play in terms of the economy? So, Deputy Speaker, my department does invest and continues to invest a considerable amount in, in apprenticeships in a, in a reformed apprenticeship programme, which is have uh, been seeking to have a higher quality of apprenticeships, learning from lessons in places like Germany and, and Switzerland and, and Austria. Um, and it's that sort of high quality I want to maintain, um, regardless of what the government is doing in terms of the levy, uh, regardless of what they are doing, in my belief, in watering down what apprenticeships are uh, in England. Uh, I want to, and I'm, I'm on side with uh, both Scotland and Wales, and all wanting to maintain very high quality of apprenticeships. Uh, we have been investing very considerably over the last year, so if you take this current uh, or the last sorry financial year, um, levels uh, two and three and level three apprenticeships had around just short of 20 million pounds invested in them, and higher level apprenticeships, which are um, are an incredibly important part of the a newer part of the offering that we're making on apprenticeships. Um, at levels four, five, and six, some 1.1 million pounds is invested. So over 20 million pounds annually has been invested in apprenticeships alone, and particularly in those higher level apprenticeships. It was with Deloitte. Uh, visiting them last week, and they were almost sort of pioneers in taking forward higher level apprenticeships, which shows that there are, there are a range of sectors um, which you didn't ordinarily associate, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, with apprenticeships who are now getting involved in taking on apprenticeships at, apprentices at that higher level. Uh, and one of the things that I hope, if there, is a, if there is a good side to this apprenticeship levy, I hope that it is it's something that encourages many employers not traditionally involved in apprenticeships to look at the options that they have, uh, and there is, of course, support there from government for that. Aram Sir Kiva Archibald, I call Kiva Archibald. Um, last week in his statement, along with the Minister for Finance, the Minister outlined that the apprenticeship levy is no benefit to the North, and again today he said it's a bad thing. Will you be making that case to the British Treasury? I mean, th th yes, this, this case has been made, and I know that my, my colleague, the Finance Minister, has been doing directly with Treasury. Uh, similar concerns have been raised with, uh, from myself and um, through the department to um, the various departments that have looked after this issue. It's now shifted back to the Department of Education. I'm seeking a meeting with the Department of Education uh, to discuss a range of issues, but uh, I'll obviously take the opportunity to raise concerns around this issue as well. So yes, it is something that, that we have been lobbying on. I know that other devolved administrations have been doing likewise. Uh, I know that they feel very, very similarly about us, uh, similarly to us uh, in respect of the damage that they believe that this is doing, uh, not least to the public finances, but also to um, possibly to, to skills training for businesses moving forward. Aram Sir Patsy McLone. I call Patsy McLone. Magad, a free you last young colleagues, we have Slation IRS and a Fragri. Thanks very much. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I, and the Minister too, uh, Cash Tree, question number three. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not yet met with the National Union of Students and the Union of Students in Ireland, but I hope to be in a position to do so in the future. My officials meet with representatives from this organisation on a regular basis to discuss a wide range of issues affecting the higher and further education sectors in Northern Ireland. 
Officials from my department's further education division have met with the National Union of Students and the Union of Students in Ireland to facilitate the provision of training for newly elected student members of college governing bodies and to attend an annual induction event for all new governing body members. My officials have also met with representatives of this body to discuss a variety of issues related to higher education. Patsy McLone for supplementary. Thanks very much, and I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister not agree that, given his uh, level of interaction with uh, various universities and the likes, that it would be crucially important that he meet too with the representative bodies of students uh, around issues such as well, education for a start, but the likes of services and fees as well? Yeah, as, as I pointed out to the member in my initial response, I have no, no issue uh, with meeting with NUS USI. Um, I would hope to do so in the not-too-distant future, as the member will appreciate. Uh, my diary is, is busy and could be filled time and time over again uh, with all of the range of requests that I get, but I do hope to be able to, to be in a position to meet with NUS USI in the not-too-distant future. I call Sandra over in. For his response, can the Minister outline any discussions on the back of his engagement with the key stakeholders in the higher education sector? What are, are his views on any increase in tuition fees, um, that, uh, considering the over 50 million shortfall in university funding? I had a range of, of discussions with uh, the universities and others in, in respect of the financing of the sector. Uh, I'm very clear, I've been on record in this House and elsewhere, that what I want to see. Um, is the, uh, the, that the higher education, important higher education sector we have, which is not just important for education, but crucially important for the future growth of our economy, um, to be financed on a sustainable footing moving, moving uh, into the, the, the years to come. Uh, there are clearly pressures uh, on my budget in respect of higher education, uh, and I want to have a, a sensible, mature discussion, uh, particularly in the context of the upcoming budget, about how we might sustainably finance the HE sector uh, in the years ahead. I call Thomas Buchan. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what is happening with postgraduate Northern Ireland student whose loan applications were incorrectly proposed by the student loan companies? Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I think the, the postgraduate students that the, the member mentions have been uh, treated disgracefully. Um, I think that the, they were, these were postgraduate loans for English domicile students that were introduced by the UK Department for this year. Uh, they wrongly approved uh, 85 uh, loans to 85 ineligible Northern Ireland students. Uh, a review found that 54 were actually eligible, but st there are still 31 who are ineligible, in 18 of whom actually received the payment. And I think these are the, the important, they're all important, but these are the particularly important ones where you know, people received the payment, they uh, spent that money on equipment or on accommodation or whatever it might have been to help them to, to do their postgraduate studies. Uh, whilst it is a matter for the UK Department of, of Education and for Student Finance England and the loans company, um, it, the, this issue, these errors have caused distress because of the errors that have been made by, by them. Uh, so I have written to uh, Joe Johnson, the uh, Education Minister for Education, uh, and also uh, to the student loan company asking them what are they going to do to to satisfactorily address this issue, which is um, not in any way, shape or form the making of the students who, from Northern Ireland who have been affected. Sir Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, can the Minister uh, tell us what, which stakeholders in the further higher education sector that he has uh, met with? Well, I, I, I couldn't give the member a comprehensive list of this, but I've met with uh, Ulster University, I've met with Queen's University, I'm actually meeting with uh, the Open University this afternoon. Um, and I'm sure I've met with, you know, in, in the broadest uh, definition of the HE sector, I've met with quite a few other stakeholders. But you know, there are, a member, as a member will appreciate, uh, there are a huge range of stakeholders across the HE sector, um, all of whom I will, as I grapple with a range of issues, and some of which have been mentioned here today in question time, I will want to, to keep in very close contact, particularly with our universities, but also with those other stakeholders as well. I call Robbie Butler. Um, Madam Principal, Deputy Speaker, question number four, please. Generation capacity are our three conventional power stations, existing interconnection, including the restored Moyle interconnector with Scotland, and the additional 250 megawatt capacity at Ballywumford, which became available in January of this year, ensures that we have enough capacity to meet all electricity demand forecasts to 2020. Emissions legislation could further impact on the Kilroot coal-fired plant, in particular, from 2020. My department is working closely with the utility regulator and the system operator, Sony, to consider how best to ensure security of supply after this point, and if considered necessary, 
I will agree further actions to safeguard our electricity supply. The second north-south interconnector is to be considered by the Planning Appeals Commission in February of next year, and this project, along with other plans such as the proposals by Evermore Energy for a new gas-fired power station in Belfast, battery storage by AES, the Electric Compressed Earth Energy Storage Project, and the Island McGee Gas Storage Project, have the potential to contribute to our future security of supply. Robbie Butler for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the Ulster Unionist Party will be putting a motion on energy to the Assembly tomorrow. Will he take the opportunity tomorrow to indicate what his plan B is, uh, should there be further planning delay in the north-south interconnector? Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I look forward to, to the debate tomorrow, not least that I think it provides uh, the whole House for, with an opportunity to be... Um, yeah, and I hope, and I hope the debate is, is brought forward in this spirit. I will certainly, if, if it is, I will certainly re respond in kind. Um, this is an issue which is a, this is a challenging issue. Uh, I think the, the the House, and I know that the committee, where um, Principal Deputy Speaker visited Sony last week, uh, and will have, I'm sure, got a very, very clear indication from them of the seriousness of this issue and the many challenges that face us. Um, so certainly, if, if, it, if the motion is brought to the House tomorrow in that spirit, I respond in, in kind. Um, you know, and the, the member has—I know the member is fairly new to the Ulster Unionist Party, but he's, all, he's already sort of got that fatalistic uh, tendency, which uh, runs through the Ulster Unionist Party like a stick of rock. Uh, he, has, he has already written off the interconnector before it has gone to uh, the Planning Appeals Planning Committee. Commission has started its hearings next year. And again, the, mem the member is right. It is, a, it is, a, it is an incredibly, it is an incredibly uh, complex issue. Uh, I wanted to run through its planning process properly. Uh, uh, and we will, we will leave it to that. But in terms of the principle of the interconnector, it is something that I am committed to. It is essential, not just in terms of uh, security of supply in the longer term, but also in terms of making any integrated single electricity market viable moving forward. So it, it is an incredibly important project. Um, I think we have, as a department, a record, not least in terms of the short-term contract that was put in place with AES, when the Moyle interconnector was out, we have a record of stepping in whenever there have been problems and taking decisive action. So, you know, I, I don't want to get into the issue of members of the party are very keen on talking about Plan Bs, uh, resigning themselves to failure right from the start. But this is not something I'm going to do. I'm going to, you know, work away at making sure that the interconnector is something that does happen because it is such a vital piece of infrastructure for uh, electricity uh, and security of supply um, in, the, in the short and in the long term. I call George Robinson. Deputy Speaker, what does the Minister intend to do to support the future development of re renewables in Northern Ireland? Principal Deputy there is already considerable support for, for renewable um, electricity already in place, and, and the Northern Ireland Renewables obligation support will remain in place until 2037. And, and, two, and I think it has, it has been uh, a successful project in this respect, and our uh, policy in this respect, in terms of increasing uh, renewables generated uh, electricity. So in 2005, before the NARA was introduced, electricity consumption from renewable sources was around 3% in Northern Ireland. Uh, that has now grown to 25.4% at the end of, of last year. And we are well on course to, to meet our 40% electricity consumption by, by 2020. There is already a considerable amount of renewables on the grid and, and a considerable amount with offers and some more to receive offers. Uh, and I believe that not only will we meet our 40% target, but whenever all of those offers uh, are met and are on grid, we will also have the ability to generate 100% of peak demand of electricity from renewable sources. That's around 1,800 megawatts per year. So I think it, in many respects it has been a successful policy. It has in terms of reflecting on what future policy might be. It does have an impact on the grid, which is a, a scarce and, and a precious resource. Uh, at present, there are no storage options, although I mentioned some possible storage options in my original answer. And of course, we do need to, as we need to do with everything, consider the cost of a replacement for the narrow. Uh, and Previously, narrow costs were spread right across all UK consumers, so Northern Ireland got a, a reasonably good deal out of that. Any replacement would be across uh, just Northern Ireland con consumers, and that would, of course, uh, have an impact on the affordability of, of electricity in Northern Ireland. That's something that I've obviously got to carefully consider in respect of the future development of renewables policy. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Iram Sir, Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister give an absolute guarantee that the teaching excellence framework is in no way intended as a link to tuition fee levels in Northern Ireland? Um, 
Principal, Deputy Speaker, the teaching excellence uh, framework is, as I understand, exactly about it almost does what it says in the tin about raising the standards of, of, of teaching in our universities. Um, it has, you know, I think it's one criticism I can recall even from before taking up this post is that you know, whilst universities rightly and understandably uh, continue to focus on research, uh, and I think we want to see our universities uh, continue to do that, and there's some promising um, progress in that regard. Um, sometimes the, the, the view is that perhaps there has been less of a focus on teaching standards. I think we would all want to see uh, that balance between teaching and research uh, remain very, very good. Um, and, and, and you know, I can say to the member that you know, in terms of the future sustainable financing of the sector, the, the um, teaching excellence framework is not one of those things that's been considered in that in that context. Uh, what I want to see is the sector, which is a very, as I mentioned previously, a very important sector not just the education, but also the wider economy in Northern Ireland, put on a sustainable fo footing for the future. Uh, and that's obviously uh, what is for, at the forefront of my mind as I consider the issue around uh, financing uh, our universities. Sinead Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. And I'd like to ask the Minister, can you also give a guarantee, although it was far short of a guarantee, that the TAF will not be used as a leverage to remove the tuition fee cap in Northern Ireland, and would he consider responding to the calls of putting a TEF panel in place in Northern Ireland? And the, the minister can choose which question to answer. I, I think I counted about four there, but I'll uh, do my best. Look, you know, I, I, I think the teaching excellence framework is, is a good thing in and of itself, um, and I don't think we should be sort of getting it into a situation where it's marred in other other debates. Look, I, I want to see the sector sustainably financed. We need a good, strong university sector in Northern Ireland. I'm very mindful and cognizant of the concerns being expressed by that sector and how it, it believes that it's falling behind its counterparts in, in the rest of the United Kingdom and indeed elsewhere. I want to ensure that Queen's University, Ulster University, Open University, who, have, who are doing a good job in Northern Ireland, particularly around their, their research and how that's aligning better with, with our economic needs, um, have, the, have the finances now and into the future that allow them to continue to do the good job that they've done already. Nelson McCausland is not in his place. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline for the House what steps his department is taking as part of an outward-looking economy to allow Northern Ireland to attract further international trade? We, we, we have, um, the Member will be, a, be aware of, of, of two things that, that I have announced, Principal Deputy Speaker, in, in recent times to try to enhance. I mean, we, we're, we're starting from a very, very, very strong base uh, already. We have about 9.5. We, we had 9.5% increase in uh, exports from Northern Ireland in the last year. The only re UK region to post an increase. Um, and I would. Um, the new figures uh, will be due out uh, very, very soon. Uh, and you know, there has been uh, backed up by the Ulster Bank's uh, Purchasing Managers Index. They talked about a surge. I think was the word that they used, Principal Deputy Speaker, in terms of exports in the last number of months. So. Um, not wishing to prejudge those statistics in any way, shape or form, not least I don't want an egg in my face, but there has been some good anecdotal evidence about progress being made over the last number of months in respect of exports. Uh, I have brought in place a trade accelerator plan, uh, which is looking at uh, building on that success and also has the aim of encouraging more exporters to get into selling their goods and services outside of the region for the first time. Because even though we've had that 9.5% increase, it has been on the back of fewer, actually, a, a decrease in the number of exporters. Uh, so it's really, really good performance. But we want to see more people selling their goods and services outside of Northern Ireland. And the Trade Accelerator Plan is aimed at doing that. It's providing more support um, for uh, exhibitions, for market study visits, and for, for trade missions. Uh, and we've also under, in the process of developing an international trade plan for Northern Ireland, which is entirely about putting Northern Ireland, making Northern Ireland an outward-looking trading nation, getting more of a presence and increased invest in I presence in key markets. Uh, setting up a trade advisory board to assist me uh, in developing new export strategies uh, and a whole range of, of different uh, endeavours to try to capitalise on the growth that we have and indeed the hu huge opportunities that will exist in the years ahead. Christopher Stalford for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, the strong connection that many people in the United States have with, with Northern Ireland is one asset, but also there has been change in America in the political scene recently. What assessment does the Minister have of the election of a new President and its ability to impact upon Northern Ireland's uh, trade with the United States? 
I, I think that the member is right to note um, that there has been change uh, in the U.S. and with the um, surprising, uh, unexpected win of Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, it is it is very very early stages in respect of uh, Mr. Trump's admission. It's not even in place. He doesn't even have an administration in, in place yet. Um, mm. But the member is right that the U.S. are a an incredibly important trading partner for Northern Ireland. They are our second biggest export destination. Uh, we sold around £1.5 billion pounds worth of, of goods to the US in the year ending um, June of 2016. And that was a, that was a staggering 74% increase year on year, really tremendous achievement for Northern Ireland exporters. They're, they're also an incredibly important source of inward investment, around 175 uh, US based or US owned companies operating outside of, in Northern Ireland, uh, employing around 24,000 people. Um, and whilst the, the president-elect has, has said many things, he hasn't he's not in post yet. He hasn't taken his agenda to, to Congress. Um, and I wish him I wish him every success in his job, and I think we should give him a chance um, because we all need America to succeed. We, Northern Ireland has benefited from the success of America in the past. We want to benefit from its success in the future. Um, but the member will appreciate and understand, as will the House, that you know even if the new president does reduce corporation tax, as he has indicated. Um, the reason why many companies from the U.S. invest in Northern Ireland is not just about, about tax; it's about skills. And I'm increasingly aware of the importance of skills in attracting companies from all around the world. Take, for example, a cybersecurity firm called Black Duck, a Massachusetts-based company, has invested in Northern Ireland, is expanding its business here in Northern Ireland, creating around 50 new jobs. It looked at opportunities in the U.S., but decided to come here to Belfast, to Northern Ireland, because of the talented. Uh, skills of, of the people from Northern Ireland. So it's a much wider issue than tax, and whilst we hope to reduce our rate of corporation tax to get us into other, uh, other markets, um, we do still have to keep an emphasis on the importance of skills within our economy. I call Gerry Mullen. Aram Sir Gerry Mullen. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline whether our universities will be subject to further cuts to their budgets uh, following the Chancellor's autumn statement and in his own budget for 2016-17? The member is asking me to prejudge two things. He's asked me to prejudge uh, an autumn statement which is to be made uh, tomorrow, although I, I will uh, accept that if you read every newspaper that's been published today and listen to every news bulletin, you probably have most of uh, the autumn statement in your hands or on, on, in front of you on the television screen. Uh, and he's also asking me to prejudge um, the discussions and deliberations that will take place within the Northern Ireland Executive. I do note from what the, the Prime Minister has said today that she intends to uh, have an increase of £2 billion pounds in research and development expenditure. Um, I think that will be a good thing for universities right across the United Kingdom uh, and hopefully too for, for Northern Ireland. Building on the success that we have in terms of figures published last week around research and development which showed a 24 per cent increase in R&D expenditure in Northern Ireland. Uh, it took us up to around £750 million pounds worth uh, of expenditure by businesses, by public sector and by universities. Universities accounting for around a quarter of that total increase, which was around about, I think, a 9% increase. So if there, are, if there is money coming from the autumn statement for research and development, I hope that our universities will be able to benefit directly from that. Jerry Mullen for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer so far. And hopefully this time you won't need a crystal ball. But uh, can the minister outline what assessment his department has undertaken with regard to EU funding going to higher education? There are great concerns in my own constituency uh, that a withdrawal of EU funding for research will result in redundancies and the closure of courses. Yeah, there, there, there is a range of um, funds, European funds, which uh, our universities and our colleges have accessed uh, down through the years. Um, and clearly, this is an issue which is um, part of the ongoing, or sorry, haven't started yet, but will be part of the negotiations that begin at some stage next year. Um, I, I, I can understand the concerns that the, the member is expressing. However, I would point out the, the uh, guarantees that the Chancellor has given in respect of particularly Horizon 2020 funding. So anything that is approved uh, whilst the UK is still a member of the European Un Union will be guaranteed beyond, beyond our exit. Um, I've also said before, Principal Deputy Speaker, in this House, and repeat again, that you know, Horizon 2020 is a project which is not limited to European Union member states. Uh, I think there are around a dozen states outside of the European Union, Turkey, Norway, others, uh, that have a veil, Israel, which have a veil of uh, Horizon 2020 funding in the past. In fact, I think the predecessor of uh, Horizon 2020, FP7, the state that had the highest per capita uh, spend was Israel. Uh, so you know, I think there are opportunities even for even after uh, UK exit from the EU for us to avail 
of funds like Horizon 2020. I call Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister for his answers thus far? I'm sure the Minister will join with me in welcoming the recent growth announcement by uh, the upper band based company Almac. And can I ask uh, the Minister what support his department is giving to manufacturing firms similar to that of Almac to help them reach their full potential? Mr. Speaker, I, I do join with the member in, in congratulating Almac on its growth. Um, and you know, I think that here, here's an example of a, of a firm which is part of a, a life and health science cluster in Northern Ireland, a growing life and, and health science cluster in Northern Ireland, which is, is outward looking, is selling more, uh, had a 50% increase in its exports over the, uh, over the last year. Almac are our core element of that uh, growing and important sector to our economy. So I congratulate them on their success and, and what we, we want to see. Um, we want to see firms, local firms, growing here in Northern Ireland, but we also want to see them expand their reach internationally. And even though this investment is in the U.S., it will solidify and support jobs here, back here in, in Northern Ireland, and importantly in, in the members' upper band constituency. Um, the manufacturing sector, in spite of what some in this house and some outside of this house will want to say, is, is a strong sector in spite of some recent and notable uh, setbacks. Uh, employment in the sector has increased by over 4 per cent in the last year. Support offered uh, between 2011 and, and September of this year uh, by Invest Northern Ireland uh, has accounted for nearly £300 million worth of assistance. Uh, that is 7 per cent more than the assistance that has gone to the services sector. And Sometimes there is a perception that the services sector does better from, from INI support. That is not the case. Um, that investment of nearly £300 million has um, promoted 14,000 new jobs over the last five years and has had a total contribution uh, of around £1.9 billion of investment to the local economy. So there is a range of support that has been made available, will continue to be made available for manufacturers like Almac and others who are growing their businesses, uh, selling outside of Northern Ireland uh, and looking to expand. Carla Lockhart for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, could the Minister just uh, ensure the House that he will continue to prioritise the skills that these uh, manufacturing businesses require? Because certainly it's something that, that is very evident when I'm out there. They're very, uh, they really do want us as a government to look at the skill set that they require. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I, 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 and I know that there are particularly particular issues with a range of different companies in, in the members' constituency are operating in very, very different sectors. Uh, and as I said before today and previously, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the importance of skills to uh, Northern Ireland's proposition, not just for inward investment, also, but also for the expansion of in, indigenous companies. So you know, I absolutely want to ensure that um, you know, as we, as we look to a future where we have a reduced rate of corporation tax principle, Deputy Speaker, uh, that that isn't the only thing that we're going out to the world to offer. We also have to offer a, a strong pipeline of skilled workers, um, and that will include helping uh, companies in the members' constituency as well as those prospective inward investors who I think are increasingly, if the evidence to me is, is, is anything to go by, are, are coming to Northern Ireland. Um, the differentiator as to why they're coming to Northern Ireland over other locations is because of the skilled uh, workforce that we have. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you to the Minister for his answers so far. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the uh, Enterprise Zone and Core Aim, please? Very quick answer from yeah, the uh, pilot scheme for the um, new uh, Core Aim Enterprise Zone was formally designated by Her Majesty's Treasury in, in August of, of 2016, just a few months ago. Uh, it offers enhanced capital allowances. It's the only um, enterprise zone in Northern Ireland and offers 100% enhanced capital allowances for qualifying expenditure in the first year. Um, I know that there a, a company f called Five Nines have, uh, who operate and uh, develop data centres already have planning permission um, for the site. That goes back, I think, to 2013, that planning permission. Uh, and what we will put in place as a department is a, a monitoring and evaluation plan to identify emerging benefits uh, that could be derived from the enterprise zone. I see it as a, an important point, part of the, the growing tech sector that there is in Northern Ireland, which is employing around 30,000 people. It's growing right across Northern Ireland, in the northwest, in Belfast, and Urie, and all parts in between. Time is up. Ms. Nicholas.